Section 7 of Weird Tales Double Feature, The Death Pit, and In Cashless Garden, by Oscar Shizgal. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Ben Tucker. In Cashless Garden, Chapter 2. When, at a few minutes before ten, Roger Bird returned to his home, he found his wife seated in her garden, and smiling pleasantly at his approach. It was a magnificent spot, this garden Kashla had caused to be planted in accordance with her oriental taste. Fronting the white-pillared house of the birds, it was thronged with all manner of exquisite flowers, so that the senses not only reeled with the sweetness of its perfume, but marveled at the splendor of a thousand brilliant hues. An artificial brook crawled here and there, crossed at points by small arched bridges that were canopied with vines. It had indeed become a showplace, and automobilists frequently stopped to stare at the glories Kashla had contrived to bring into her garden. Butterflies fluttered about incessantly, intoxicating themselves on the exotic wines the flowers yielded. In the surrounding trees, birds of vivid plumage sang and chirped and pecked as though they had agreed to select this point of beauty for their own domain. Kashla sat in a wicker chair under a bower of rambling red roses, a neglected book lying open in the grass beside her. She was attired completely in flimsy white, and even Bird could not deny her entrancing loveliness. For Kashla was beautiful, beautiful in the maddening way only women of the East can achieve. Her hair, which was as lustrously black as the plumes of the crows that sometimes circled over her garden, was drawn down tightly over her ears and coiled in an immense bun on the back of her neck so that she resembled, in her white dress, some ancient Grecian goddess. She never availed herself of cosmetics, and her smooth skin, though tinted to an olive complexion, was always pale. But it was a queer pallor, an unhealthy, unnatural pallor. Often it made Bird think of death. In truth, Kashla was not a healthy woman. Frail, supple, small in stature, her mental strength had been developed at a lamentable sacrifice of her physical hardihood, so it was that she never indulged in anything which required exertion, her most taxing exercise being occasional walks about the garden, and she moved there with the ease and the languor of a phantom. Like other frail women, she was addicted to tonics and medicines, many of which were compounded on oriental prescriptions. But these in no manner affected her mental strength, and she governed her husband with all the energy of her fierce fantastic power. When he entered the garden, she summoned him with a slow wave of her white hand. Bird went to her, frowning. "'You have been out on your morning walk?' she inquired amiably. Her voice, though throaty, contained all the flexible music of a clarinet. He nodded. "'And today?' she pressed on. "'You have not forgotten, Roger, what you must do today?' In the past two years she had learned to speak English with astounding proficiency." though she still retained a melodious accent that evoked delight from everyone save Bird himself. He glared down at his toe. Today, he said stiffly, you want me to buy you the new town car. Ah, you remember, and you will leave soon? Immediately. He had not wished to purchase the new car that Kashla desired, yet he comprehended the folly of protesting. If he did not comply with her request willingly, he knew he would obey in a different way, and voluntary acquiescence was invariably preferable to being subjected to her weird influence. "'Then go now, Roger,' said Kashla, smiling at him and gesturing toward the house. Her flaming black eyes laughed up at him, as though mocking his helplessness. He bit his lip, bit until he felt a sharp pain. Then he muttered something and went into his house, preparatory to the unavoidable trip to the city. So eager had he been to interview Mr. Curry at his home that he had not paused to shave, and now Roger Bird, passing through a corridor that reeked of oriental incense and mounting a staircase whose wall was tapestried with the figures of snakes and dragons, entered the bathroom. As thoughtfully, resentfully, he loosened his collar and drew off his shirt, he stared through the open window. The rattle of a lawnmower rose through the warm stillness of the summer morning. Bird looked down. There was Ozul, the Indian gardener Kashla had brought to tend her flowers. A bent, swarthy little man who seemed engrossed in no other worldly interest save his botanical duties. He was pushing the lawnmower to and fro, to and fro. 
Azul the Silent, the queer, the man who appeared sometimes to see and know everything, and who seldom spoke of anything but flowers. What a crowd she's drawn me into, actually rasped Bird as he turned for his shaving brush. Before him, just above the washbowl, was a marble shelf loaded with Kashla's medicines and tonics. He sneered at it. He hated those bottles, as he hated everything symbolic of his wife. One of the bottles was almost empty. It contained a brown fluid in which Kashla had been accustomed to place absolute faith. What it was, Bird did not know. Some queer concoction brought out of India. One she took twice a day, at nine in the morning and at four in the afternoon. Peculiar stuff, he told himself while shaving. There was but a mouthful left in that bottle, only a single dose. Had she the prescription for another supply? But of course, Kashla had all her prescriptions. Her life depended on them. She had once confided to him. What could be so potent in this tonic? He had never seen any of it in this country. It looked like iodine. Yes. Iodine, iodine, iodine. Of a sudden, Roger Bird stopped shaving. He stood rigid, his wide eyes gaping at his lathered reflection in the mirror. It looked like iodine. It has been said that men conceive a thousand vagrant fancies while shaving. How this particular idea ever struck Roger Bird, he could not explain. It simply came to him, as if it were an inspiration. A horrible thought it was. It stiffened every muscle in his tall body. Iodine. He began to think, frantically, desperately, wildly. He considered the idea from every possible angle. What if Mr. Curry could somehow have the marriage annulled? What if he could secure a divorce on some grounds? Would that terminate Kashla's power? No. She had promised to be the mistress of Bird's mind forever, and forever meant until death. Until death. Death was the only thing that could sever the bond that linked his subjugated mind to her hypnotic power. Death. Rivulets of perspiration oozed out of his forehead to stream down into the lather. Death. The tonic looked like iodine. There was iodine in the medicine chest. Death. Iodine. Round and round in a furious cycle, the thoughts whirled in his brain. People would say she had taken iodine by mistake. Others had died by drinking from the wrong bottle. It was nothing novel. And so easy now. He could pour out that tonic and substitute an equal amount of iodine. Koshla would gulp it down in one swallow as usual. And then, the end of mental tyranny, the end of slavery, of torture, freedom. Oh, great God, what an idea. The lather was still on his face, but Roger Bird had forgotten it. He was breathing rapidly, heavily, as he worked over those bottles. Whatever horror he may have experienced was overwhelmed by the mad exultation he derived from a vision of freedom. This was the only way, the only certainty by which his mental shackles could be destroyed. And he leaped at it eagerly, unthinkingly. When the tonic had been spilled into the washbowl, he allowed water from the faucet to gush out forcefully, that it might wash away all stains. Then he carefully, oh, so carefully, poured iodine into the medicine bottle. It was done. Roger Bird stood quaking, yet oddly ecstatic. His eyes blazed. Perspiration coursed freely down his entire body. While he was in New York purchasing a new town car, the thing would happen. Consequences? He did not care about them or worry as to what might be his eventual explanation. Anything was better than a continuance of this fearful life. The coroner would declare she had taken poison by mistake. What else could he say? Oh, but yes, there was a danger. It occurred to Roger Bird quite abruptly and left him frowning in bewilderment. Would not any investigator know that iodine had been poured into that tonic bottle? Would not any detective demand to know who had poured it and why? For several minutes, Bird contemplated this hitherto neglected peril. In his agitation, he had viewed only the ultimate escape from Kashla's power. Now other things occurred to him. But his mind was functioning with furious rapidity. In a moment, he had developed a scheme which brought a shrewd smile to his lathered face. He broke off the neck of the iodine bottle against the edge of the marble shelf. 
Spilling the rest of its contents into the wash bowl, he threw the remnants of the bottle into a metallic basket in a corner. And now he had assured himself of a plausible alibi, one which would prevent anyone's accusing him of willful or premeditated murder. For he could say to an inquirer, Yes, I poured the iodine into that medicine bottle. Why? Well, when I reached for my razor, I inadvertently upset it. The bottle fell and broke at the neck, but a little iodine remained in its bottom. I saw that empty medicine bottle and poured it into that. Empty? Uh, of course, the medicine bottle was empty. And who could oppose him in that contention with Koshla dead? Who indeed would doubt him? Roger Bird actually grinned with the prospect of freedom from his wife's power. Oh, he might be held for homicide, but with a clever, influential attorney like Mr. Curry, with so plausible an explanation of his unintentional act, with his family name, with the aura of an accidental catastrophe hovering over the whole business. Freedom, muttered Roger Bird. And then, suddenly glancing through the window, he saw Ozul the gardener. Ozul was still pushing the clattering lawnmower, steeped in his task with bovine complacence. Yet, Ozul might have been looking up through that open window. Nonsense, Bird assured himself. He's been busy. He doesn't even know I'm here. There's nothing for me to worry about. Why, by tonight I'll... I'll be free. Free from her! And he shaved joyfully, confident that his apprehensions concerning Ozul were unfounded and insignificant. End of In Kashla's Garden, Chapter 2